Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from several exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Uh, hello from Belgium. Was coming to you from several exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Uh, hello from Belgium. Kara. Hello from Germany. David. Moin from Germany. And I'm your host, Fen, located in the Baltic Sea. Uh, today we're going to be sinking under the tide sea. Uh, today we're going to be sinking under the tides with Atlantis rising, taking flight across the continents with Wingspan, exploring the shattered wasteland apocalypse with Mutant Year Zero, and suffering repeating bouts of amnesia with Mind MGMT. Or is it Mind Movement? I don't... Before we get into all of that, we'll start with a standy catch-up. What have you been up to, David? Oh, I had a pr pretty busy time, but I'm now a certified project manager, so that's great. <laughs> also had a uh, had a job interview today, which went pretty fine, I think. I hope so. <laughs> Win. Uh, well, okay, it's uh, still pretty stressful in school, um, but um, recently I actually managed to play some games like in person with some people again. Um, we played Deep Sea Adventure and um, Legends of Andor, the third part, and um, something else. I don't remember the name. It was a small two-player game. You had these hexagonal playing pieces with different insects on them and hive. Yeah, you build the playing pieces with different insects on them and hive. Yeah, you build the grid as you play, like they're baker-like tiles. They go, yeah, they go next to each other, and then you can move them as well. And you basically have to surround the enemy queen. Yeah, that's that's hive. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty... yeah, that's that's hive. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's a pretty abstract. amazing game, and it, it's really small, amazing, easy to teach, um, lots of fun. Yeah, if you enjoy that, you may want to look at the Project GIPF games, which are also two-player abstract games um, with a theme around sh or zert. But you can look them up on uh, it's Project GIPF, which is G I P F, I think. Um, uh, hang on, let's make sure I get that right. Yes, GIPF project. Yeah. Yes. And uh, next week we will meet up to continue our Dungeons and Dragons uh, campaign. So that's something to look forward to. And um, yeah. So um, what about you, Alexis? Um, well, I've not been able to to play in my uh, Dune. Um, the the recent re-edition of it uh, with the um, the the sandstorms moving around and stuff. And it's been pretty fun, but I think that I will need a few more games to have a good opinion on it, of it because it's kind of complex, especially with the, the way the different families interact with each other. But I've been I've been um, somehow been in a in a chess danger recently, and I've been uh, trying to get back into the the one of the oldest game uh, board game that uh, that we can uh, we can all enjoy. Um, and it's been it's been fun, and I'm finally getting uh, getting better again. So lots of retro. Well, Dune is pretty old again. I think it's more recent than chess. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, definitely, it's about 500 years <laughs> after chess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chess is about the 15th century, and yeah. um, uh, Dune, I think, is sometime in the future. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if it was Star Wars, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if it was Star Wars, obviously that would be before chess. Yeah, so that course. Star Wars chess game predates chess. Um, obviously, because long, long time ago. Yeah. Fun yeah. fact, by the way, I just I, I just looked up from when chess is, and 3D chess is from 1851, and 3D chess is from 1851. I thought Star Trek introduced it, but no, it was 1851. Oh. That's interesting because I, I, my local stockist actually got a copy of the Star Trek 3D chess set in, um, like the Star Trek 3D chess set in, um, like 
last week and it's like 200 euros um, <laughs> no. yes yeah, it's, it's the full recreation of it with working rules and everything nice um, very cool uh, and what about you fans oh um so what about you fans oh um so I've been playing a lot of uh, I'm gonna get his name wrong Vitel Lacerda games uh, so um, Kanban EV um, which is all about being as efficient as possible as constructing cars on Mars which is all about which is all about me staring at the rule book and still not quite trying to under being able to understand what's going on um, I'm struggling with on Mars I really am I've watched a bunch of videos uh, but I got to play the gallerist and um, that one is a lot lighter than the other two I, I and I found it as easy to understand as Kanban and in it for a year now and I, my eyes just glaze over so I'm gonna put it on the shelf and wait for the cooperative expansion to come up and that might change things and I, yeah and I also got to play the it's not the disc well it used to be the disc world board game but obviously the licensing oh. and it's every bit as good as the disc world one is um, mechanically it's just not as good not, as, not as it thematically well, yeah, yeah. Victorian London's pretty good as a theme goes, but it's it's no Discworld, it's no Ankh-Morpork. pork. Um, and, and last of all, I finally got myself Sushi Go Party. I've had Sushi Go forever to upgrade to Sushi Go Party, which I did. I almost talked about that today. Oh. And Get Bit, which I've wanted for years, um, which is a board game where you are a bunch of robots swimming away from a shark and everybody's trying to avoid being the robot at the back because if they are, <laughs> then they're going to get bit and lose a piece of themselves, which is probably why they're themselves, which is probably why they're robots because that explains why they can keep swimming when they've only got one arm. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's just a fun, silly little put it out and have an enjoyable time kind of game. So yeah, that's that's mostly been been it. Um, on the gaming front. That does sound nice. It does sound nice. Yeah, yeah, it has been. Yep. <clears throat> and and I've been playing the game which I'm going to talk about today as well. Oh, that's my. Hi. Oh, I miss you. Hey. Oh, well, oh, you, 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 you. Hello. Where, where are you coming from? <laughs> this is so surprising. <laughs> well, this this was unexpected. Yes. <laughs> expected. <laughs> okay. How have you been doing, Alessio? <laughs> oh, uh, doing rather well. It happened a lot of stuff this week. Um, I'd say, uh, first, uh, I actually continued. Uh, I actually continued my campaign with uh, with uh, uh, the Scent Legends of the Dark, and I'm very, very close to the end. And I have to say, this game has captivated me. So uh, this is probably the last you will hear from me until we talk about it. Uh, great, I have to say great. Um, second, I, I kind of uh, have uh, an appointment with, to, to, to play a game date, if you want, with uh, one of our listeners, Brendan, today <laughs> because uh, he's actually vacationing in... Uh, near my home so probably we'll manage to to have a try of a game i think we will play mind, mind management actually wonderful <laughs> yeah so uh i guess uh, e e everyone so uh i guess uh, e e everyone uh, everyone is ready so i think we can start start yes <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, now that we're all caught up, it's time to talk about the first game, which I alluded to during my little segment. Uh, we're all caught up, it's time to talk about the first game, which I alluded to during my little segment. I've been playing this a fair bit. Uh, this is the one to seven player cooperative game from Gallen Cicel. Uh, pronunciation's always mangled, guaranteed. Uh, Atlantis Rising. Uh, from Elf Creek Games. It's a one to seven player uh, from Elf Creek Games. It's a one to seven player worker placement game about the end times of Atlantis. Um, the tagline is Can you save the island of Atlantis? Uh, I gotta say, the answer is actually no, you can't because it's sinking, but can you save the population? Um, so, um, 
So, you will, with all the other people you're playing with, sit down uh, with two boards. First board is a six peninsula island that looks like a starfish or starmy from Pokemon. Uh, it's where all of the like the island itself is and all the industries located. And this is more of a abstract mosaic kind of board. It represents the get cosmic gate that you you and your fellow Atlanteans with your amazing technology of whenever BC are going to construct a gate and leave Earth and not come back, except to maybe menace uh, some 1990s heroes in an awful movie or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so this game, needless to say, pretty unusual in that it's a worker placement cooperative game, which you don't get a lot of cooperative worker placement games. Typically, they're kind of more point movement games like Pandemic or Arkham, or they're card games like Regicide or On Mars, you know, or they're miniature based games. Um, so I think that's pretty neat in itself. Uh, but the really cool stuff all happens in how the worker placement's done. So initially, the Cosmic Gate's got almost nothing on it except spots where you build modules. And the modules for the Cosmic Gate are picked at the start of the game. It's got a few recommended setups for you, but there's a whole load of choices. So that will change the texture of the, the game there and like mix things up. You can also pick the difficulty. That's a bit more like Pandemic in that you'll be putting in cards to make a Misfortune deck easier or harder. Um, and then the last piece is sort of randomization at setup so input randomization is the character you play because not only do you have workers but you've got one worker who's more special than the rest they're bigger they're fancier and they have special powers people like the uh, the priestess the guardian and so on and they'll have an ability that kind of chimes to their own particular larger worker you also have a load of workers off the board which you can try and pick up so Game flow, very simple. Everybody decides where they're going to put their workers. Now, the best locations are near the ends of the peninsulas, but those places are most likely to flood, sink, and disappear from the board. And if you're on them when that happens, you're not going to get anything because you don't get anything until after flooding has happened. So you place, you draw misfortune, and then you find out if you can do so. So it's, a, it's an educated gamble and or choice, which is, I think, really cool. Um, the peninsulas themselves are all themed around one specific thing. You've got a place where you can pick up magical crystals, one where you can get gold, one where you can get iron ore, one where you can smelt the iron ore into iron bars. And those iron bars are like, I think they're proper pieces. You can smelt the iron ore into iron bars. And those iron bars are like, I think they're proper pieces of little metal. They feel very weighty and cool. Uh, there's a library peninsula, just nothing but books, where you can learn like one-off powers or permanent powers to use during the game. And then the city, where you can get extra workers. Um, uh, there's a cap to how many books, where you can learn like one-off powers or permanent powers to use during the game. And then the city, where you can get extra workers. Um, uh, there's a cap to how many extra workers you can get. I think it depends on the number of players, but with the bigger groups, the maximum you can have each is four. Uh, so there's a lot of different places to go and groups, the maximum you can have each is four. Uh, so there's a lot of different places to go and e each peninsula can have multiple spots, but the resource gathering ones involve dice rolls. And uh, so there's no guarantee and the better numbers sit near the end of the peninsula. And also you will at, at times get more resources from the end of the peninsula. But there's less spots as well to go there so it's very much a juggling act and on top of that you can always go to the middle of the board and you can gather energy the middle of the board is the last piece to sink always energy you don't use it to build anything but you can use it to erect magical barriers that will prevent the next flooding on a given peninsula so if something's super important you can get a bit of energy and protect it and that's what's really nice about this is while there's a lot of randomization in the setup and you don't know which peninsulas are going to sink, you've got loads of mitigation you can do. You can pick up, you, you know what you're going to have to build to complete the engine because all of the costs are in advance. You know where you got to go, you know what you got to do, but you don't know if you're going to succeed at it and you don't know what's going to sink or when. So honestly, 
fantastic game and amazingly i played this one player really tight interesting they had uh, uh, an automaton who gives you like makes makes locations easier to succeed in and a hologram who gives you an extra random follower each turn who's like a leader um but then when you get to the higher numbers it all kind of reduces down in the number of actions each player has the number of workers they and the misfortunes start hitting faster because you draw one per player it's very cool this this game is super well balanced it's gorgeous every single component is just the, all the colors have unique workers um, the hologram is like a shiny hologram character the the, the all the resources are like made out of different materials so they, they're not just tokens they're physical ones um, and the entire thing fits into a a nice insert where it all goes in place and honestly this is such a good production it's one of those ones that's so good that you look and go oh i hope they don't do an expansion because i'm not going to fit the expansion in this main box like parks yeah yeah um but I, i've been playing this a fair amount it's just a good production it's a great solo the great solo game it's a great group game and it's not super difficult to play it's quite accessible and the constant scaling of difficulty that you can choose at the start you can you can have like the hologram available to make things easier or you can have the automaton to make things easier or you can uh, give people more sort of like um better different components for the gate because once you construct a component it becomes a place that either does something immediately to give you a bonus or gives you a place to put workers so the game is really customizable to your skill level and that is just fantastic you know i, I didn't know about a lot about uh, atlantis rising before uh, hearing uh, about it uh, here but uh, i have to say a thing it, it kind of resonates with the palio uh, th there's th there are a couple of things in common i think action deck like for instance with events or the or the actual turn order or, or something like uh, uh, th the modules you can add and i'm saying this because in palio the best thing i played in that game was the the, the module player mostly solo player of this kind of games and uh, uh, I, I loved the variants in starting condition, in game condition. I, is this kind of similar? It's more, it's less? It's different, no. Um, the modules are just single tiles. So you will vary, um, but the main changes that are happening are to the, the deck. So it's more like the way Pandemic scales its, mis it, its um, Pandemic deck. You know, it's, it's Outbreak deck. Uh, you can have... It, it, there's always flooding in there you get to put more cards in that give you turns where let double check at some point but uh it's um <laughs> it, it has that kind of scaling where you just make the deck harder or easier depending on how you adjust it um anyway, anyway gotcha this is quite different then. yes yeah it's 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 very different it reminds me far more of a more complex and deep version of complex and deep version of pandemic with worker placement than um than paleo paleos i think there's way more going on in paleo on the chaotic random front because paleo is very much <laughs> you get a bit of an idea of what's going to happen to you but you've got to what's going to happen to you but you've got to you don't find out exactly until you draw the card whereas at most of atlantis rising you can wait all the odds and you can even say this peninsula is not going to flood this turn because i'm going to put some gates on it so you've got more planning it's it's um it's really you've got more planning it's it's um it's really a thing to see when you play with a large group because there's so much going on and you've got to coordinate so much that it feels very collaborative which I do, I do really like it. One thing that I really like about uh, Atlantis is the way that the board looks. I like about uh, Atlantis is the way that the board looks. It's very unusual. And it very is. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's very clean and clear. Um, except for sometimes 
you might get a little confused between the three, the the two green zones, which I do it uh, when I draw a card for forest. A card for forests. I'm like, which one's forests again? I, I eventually internalized forests as crystals, um, and the lighter green one is gold. But you see, like I can't even remember the name of the lighter green one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's it, it, it's a little slow at times it would have been helpful if um if there'd been um if there'd been iconography of it like a tree on every forest tile but when you push them together like to join them the jigsaw puzzles so satisfying and when you turn them over and you see the sunken remains of atlantis like washing under the the waves it makes me i don't have phobia, but i almost do when i look at phobia but i almost do when i look at that board when it's sinking and i'm like Ugh. <laughs> oh no thank you no thank you i live on an island i'd hate to see it flooding um yeah so that that's my recommendation for for you know really good cooperative game that's also great solo. Uh, it's just just a little bit more accessible. But we're going to talk about another game that's probably even more accessible next. Yeah, and, I have uh, a question. Yeah, go on. Um, when I look it up, uh, the starfish shaped board. There are pictures of the starfish shaped board on a regular board. Yep, yeah. I don't know. Second edition. Okay. Yeah. So uh, also, um, why yeah. seven players? The starfish island has six arms. Why is it I seven d- players? I, 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 to disturb I, you. I, I don't, uh, well, there is a gate in the middle, so technically there's six peninsulas and and the gate. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's to disturb you. Maybe it's because they couldn't make it work with eight players. You know. A- anyway. Uh... Techno magic uh, setting for Atlantis is best setting, like Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Kids play that game. Yeah, it's a it's a great uh, great setting. This kids play that game. Yeah, it's a it's a great uh, great setting, and um, yeah, the the Atlantean uh, went up to the stars apparently. Yeah, that's what we learned in Stargate. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, remember that uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Yeah, but uh, remember that uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis uh, is a game which is better than the last two movies of Indiana Jones. Let's not get into the last Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> what, what are you talking? The last Indiana Jones movie and the young Indiana Jones. movie What are you too. talking about? The last Indiana Jones movie gave us CGI Shia LaBeouf wonderfully bad things I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last thing Shia LaBeouf did. And it, it gave think. us nuking the fridge as a pop culture reference as well. <laughs> yeah, nuking the fridge. Yeah, it is a thing that happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can enjoy the next Indiana Jones thing just to continue with the progression away <laughs> from pulpy adventure towards pulpy sci-fi. Yeah. Um, so that's that's Atlantis Rising. Um, I honestly, I think for me, eight out of ten, maybe nine out of ten. Like this is an incredible production. It's a really good game, um, and it's quite unique in all possible and far more popular. Uh, and it's been a long time coming, so it's time for us to talk about birds have you heard that the bird is the word because it is and that word <laughs> is wingspan so kara take it away yeah so let's uh, go away from sinking islands towards a beautiful land and just watch birds that's basically the story of uh, wingspan um so in wingspan um i think yeah one to five players um just collect birds and um, it's, as you said, it's a very accessible game because it technically doesn't have a lot of rules and a lot going on at first sight. So um, you play over four turns and um, or four rounds and uh, each round is limited by the number of actions you can do. I think the first round and uh, each round is limited by the number of actions you can do. I think the first round is like uh, eight actions and in the second round it's seven actions and every t- uh, round one less. So when it's your turn you do one action and then the next player is round one less. So when it's your turn you do one action and then the next player is and there are only four actions. Um, 
as I said, the game is basically you being an ornithologist and collecting birds. So you sit there and just watch for birds and where they land. So um, one of the actions is drawing cards. Yeah, you can draw new birds into your hand. Then you have an action that you can play these cards into one of uh, three uh, habitats. You have uh, forests, you have uh, play have wetlands and um, and then you can collect uh, bird feed to you know feed the birds uh, you can only place them somewhere when you give them food because basically with the food you uh, <coughs> lure them <coughs> lure them towards you and uh, the last action is laying eggs which technically not you are doing but the birds and um yeah that's more or less the whole game um it sounds kind of the whole game um it sounds kind of boring but it isn't and um because all these things have just some more going on one of those things is um the different habitats correspond to an action so uh, for example, laying eggs uh, correction. So, uh, for example, laying eggs uh, corresponds to uh, the plains habitat, and the more birds you have in this habitat, the better the action becomes. Uh, the same with drawing cards. Normally, you can only draw one card if you do this action, but if you play it, for example, four birds into, and um, so that's one thing um, that. Uh, influences what you do so you really have to decide okay where do I want to play a bird birds can't be played everywhere for example the bird on the cover uh, the uh, the German name is Scherenschwanz Königstyran if I translate it word by word it's the scissor tail king tyrant <laughs> um, I, that's um, a good name for bird wait. king fisher Flycatcher, scissor tail it's a fly, it's, flycatcher. Yeah, it's a, a flycatcher. Yeah. So that's the bird on the covers. And uh, this one can only be played in planes because apparently these birds don't live in wetlands or woods. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of decision going on. Um, you draw a bird that might be played in different habitats. So you have to decide where do we want to improve the action. Also, the different birds have different abilities. Some birds give some bonus ability when you play them. Others, like the scissor-tailed flycatcher, have a brown segment on their card, which means if you activate the action of them, you also activate this ability. Yeah? Um, so in this case, uh, everyone gets a warm with, for bird feet. And um, so that means while you play, continue playing birds, uh, you also build little engines uh, with your and um, the first round isn't very interesting, but it becomes more. And in the last round, um, a lot of things can happen. Yeah. So someone activates, uh, uh, chooses an action and goes through it. Okay, this word gives this bird gives me this. Now this bird means I draw a card like this and and so on. So um, yeah, that's um, pretty cool. And you kind of grow into it. So it's not like you start the game and you're overwhelmed with uh, different abilities and choices. It it builds up, um, which makes it accessible. Um, you in the four actions and start playing and. Uh, people will learn more about it the longer the play that's, and that's fine yeah that's yeah, actually that's, a um, question that i had for for those that that play the game because i only played wingspan uh the digital version it has a very good um steam version it is. and i was kind of wondering how if the the physical game is in any way overwhelming because you have a lot of different actions and a lot of different interactions between the cards i was wondering how um you know on, a, on the board it feels to to see how everything works together well well i was going to chime ah. in and say i have played this with my indoors who um they're swedish and um 
uh, my mother-in-law, she speaks, well, her, her English is good, but she's not super confident with it. Um, we played wingspan in English and she wingspan in English and she first time playing, she wiped the floor with all of us while constantly saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm <laughs> I doing. Think, I, I hate think those people. I think that's more of a, um, a mother power. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, it might be a mother power, but my father-in-law loved it so much, um, and he's not a big board gamer, loved it so much, um, and he's not a big board gamer, that he has had the Swedish edition, like, on Please Tell Me When It's In Stock, with all of the board game um, shops in Stockholm um, since he first played it. Wonderful. He so desperately wants it in Swedish. He loved it. Uh, he loves birds anyway, but he was like, this is just not too complex. And by the end of it, you're doing a lot. In, in many ways, for me, it reminds me of San Juan and Race of the Galaxy and that, where you start off relatively simple, but it's less overwhelming on the choices for beginning. I like games that do that. It, it does ease you into... Yeah, yeah. Um... I, I would say that race engine builder, but uh, wingspan is definitely my favorite, uh, more complex version of it. I think that it, it does a lot of really interesting things with the way that it, it generates resources. It has the different regions that you can play stuff on. It's it's less straightforward, but it has a lot more depth. I feel it has a lot more depth. I feel. Oh, I have opinions about oh. that. Mm, I do as well. I'd say it's uh, more straightforward than Race of the Galaxy and has less depth. But that doesn't mean it's a worse game. This is far more accessible. Race for the Galaxy is obscenely complex. Yeah, exactly. Race for the Galaxy. I complex. Yeah, exactly. Race for the Galaxy, I think, is the most complex card game with an engine building uh, part I uh, ever uh, played. Uh, 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 I get to contradict you there. Glory to Rome is the most complex <laughs> card game with engine building. Uh, I I wouldn't uh, just call Glory to Rome just engine building. But it is. It is in just engine building. But it is. It is in essence engine building for the most part. But let's not get into that. We're, we're talking about Wingspan. And, yeah. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. And, and the expansions. And anyway, yeah, cute bird. No, no, no. I, I want to say something about Wingspan. Okay, this game to me. Uh, I think that this game as game is actually a bit... Uh, um, it's in, it's uh, entry level, so it's uh, very simple and you can manage to play it. It's, it is true that there is a big selection of birds which can be overwhelming, but, but a lot of the birds are repeated in powers. So it's true that uh, Elizabeth Argrave had a great love for this game. It's a, it it uh, exudes passion because it, it, it shows that it's made with love. But uh, I have to say it is kind of simple. And you say, oh, it's, it, to say it is kind of simple. And you say, oh, it, it's, it's only okay. It's a kind of uh, light German. Uh, while this is true, the game grows on you, meaning that uh, you start uh, thinking about combos and stuff uh, because you, you learn that thinking about combos and stuff uh, because you, you learn that uh, you need bursts uh, that lay eggs because then uh, you can uh, fill in more ranks in the habitats, then uh, you go for nesting birds, uh, then you occasionally trash predatory birds because predatory birds sucks, and, uh, and uh, then you go with uh, migratory birds because they are o o overpowered and so on. And that's phase two. Then there's a phase three with core wingspan, which is basically, uh, okay, this game is completely random. If you draw two migratory birds at the beginning, uh, I have lost. About expansions, I have to say, expansions do a good job at rebalancing things. And now to you, I have done. <laughs> so, um, in that case, I haven't reached phase three yet. Um, I'm really happy with the game. I never felt that something is completely overpowered, but... Um, Yes, abilities are repetitive. It's not like every bird has a unique ability. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, it's a fun, simple game. I don't think the goal here is to entertain these hardcore uh, gamers that are brain cruncher games. Um, 
but um, for me it's a um, relaxing game and a game that's great to introduce um, non-board gamers into more complex games and um, also it's just pretty the uh, the different birds are just beautiful and um, i mean i studied biology so there's that but um <clears throat> yeah the big downside i studied biology and i'm from europe is um i studied biology and i'm from europe is um they the birds are all birds that uh, are native to north Amer north america um so there are not a lot of familiar birds but as you mentioned there are expansions and the first expansion is the europe expansion birds but as you mentioned there are expansions and the first expansion is the europe expansion which uh, adds to the uh, how many birds are there 170 birds in the core game i think about 80 or so european birds uh, which is just great to see these fam birds uh, which is just great to see these familiar birds in a game and um, but doesn't really change anything from the mechanic side um, there's not really a lot of new stuff going on with the europe expansion it's it's flair and yeah? you have more variety with and um, you have european birds which is nice and then there is another expansion which i don't have yet but i do uh, <laughs> uh, you you forgot to mention that the european expansion uh, apart from not just being american ethnocentric has purple eggs Yet right. more eggs right. and, and that's because <laughs> eggs because obviously you've run out of eggs which you never do by um, the way i i should point out here for listeners who don't know the game this was something that really confused us the first time we played because there are eggs in different colors inside the game uh they, you have blue and but... white and, <laughs> and um green and, and but... white and, and um green and the first thought is yeah one color for each player but no oh, the oh, colors oh. don't mean anything <laughs> you can just put them all in one bag and mix them it doesn't yeah matter. they're just eye candy <laughs> eggs is eggs is eggs yeah um so again yeah yeah they're just eye candy <laughs> eggs is eggs is eggs yeah um so again yeah the yellow eggs in oceana are just more eggs than you'll ever possibly need but oceana does a load of stuff to actually mix things up uh, for a starter you get um, set collection stuff for nest types of ways in amongst the cards which is really interesting and cool you can draw a tile for a round you know the goal tiles this one has no goal at all you just spend a round developing not worrying about what the goal for the turn is which really does like help That's give good. you a turn to relax and my favorite goal tile which way are your birds and who has the most of those? Um, <laughs> the other good thing about this is there's actually a reduction in the number of egg-related goals. Because I don't know if you noticed, but in Wingspan and in Europe, eggs are really good. Because ed eggs are on the goals, eggs are worth points, eggs help you do stuff, eggs, eggs, eggs. <laughs> uh, Oceana looks to kind of make stuff to do and just let eggs be good as eggs. It also has a whole new set of food dice because it introduces nectar. And nectar, because it's Oceana, like there's a lot of nectar eating birds there. Uh, it's a wild food type, um, but you can't save it from round to round. And oh. when you use it, it's from round to round. And oh. when you use it, it goes on your player board and gets stored towards points goals at the end of the game. Um, so that mixes everything up there. Also, your player boards, you get new ones. They give you ways to reset the bird feeder and the bird tray because I don't know if you've played those points where you just there's like all the food like all the food is different but none of it's what you need and so you can't manage to get a refresh on the bird feeder. Um, all the all the birds are terrible so everyone's just drawing from the top of the deck all the time. They give you ways to do that. These are all great. Um, there are also some birds with end of game abilities. So you pick them and they don't do anything until right at the end. Most yeah, of all. Good. The single most important thing that it does is it includes Nymphus Hollandicus, which every bird game should have, which are cockatiels to everyone else. <laughs> I am absolutely, completely not biased about this matter. The little screaming shits who live in my conservatory 
do do be honest did you buy this expansion just because of the cockade yards I did. I did. But also, I really like Australian birds, especially New Zealand birds as I, well. I'm wondering, do they have the Australian magpie that is known to be extremely aggressive to people? Yes, they do. Yeah, they have the Australian oh, magpie, the... yeah. It's... Yes, of course. Yeah, there are there are Kiwis and there's the way cooler flightless bird, um, uh, which I will, again, probably pronounce incorrectly, but the kakapo, oh. which is the cute little <laughs> green parrot thing. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, they got um, black swans. They got the abbot's boob ones. They got the abbot's boobies. Um, what does, do, do they have ostriches? Um, I not. I can't remember the photo I've got here right now because my expansions upstairs doesn't have the ostrich li uh, listed on these, so I'm not sure. I couldn't answer. I'd have to go upstairs and who's got time for that? But it does go upstairs and who's got time for that? But it does it does have the, the budgerigars. It does seem like a great expansion. Yeah. They, they've done a lot to look at what wasn't working in the core game and built an expansion to actually try and Im improve it and add to it um, uh, while building on some of the stuff from Europe as well. So it, it's, of the two, it, it's of the two expansions. Mechanically, I think it's the best one and I think it's almost essential to the game. Um, but again, if you're from Europe, the birds you know, they're in the Europe expansion and it's still pretty good. You know, I just had a thought that birth name that birth names kind of sound made up and then i realized yes of course they are made up every word is made up <laughs> just a question from my side is there the uh, kia available like this bird from new zealand it's like a greenish parrot which like is super intelligent super intelligent and they can get annoyed like they can like sometimes do crazy things in uh, New Zealand. I think they even disassemble cars, like parts of the cars, like the... <laughs> I, I'm not sure. There's 95 birds in total in the expansion, okay. and I've only got like 30. You'd have to sit and, and pour through it all. Um, I wasn't planning. You don't this wasn't my segment. From, from my end, just... yeah. I mean, there's a lot of birds, and if you're not an ornithologist, uh, you would not know most of them. No, I know a few like the fun ones like Count Baggy's Bird of Paradise because like uh and of course the classics like the Kiwi and as you mentioned the the Australian magpie. Yeah. That's one of the game end birds by the way. It has a special um ability at the end of the game. But yeah, that's uh, that's what that's what Oceana brings to it and I think um it's for people who love wingspan, I think it's wingspan, I think it's like a must buy. I definitely will want to to give it a try. That's for sure. Again, one of those expensive podcast episodes for me. <laughs> Got two on my list now. Mm. Oh dear. Yeah. Well, uh, mm. oh dear. Yeah. Well, uh, that is, uh, that's a lovely, lovely wingspan. Um, but we're going to move on now. I don't think we're going to get too far away from birds with this one, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Um, that there are some birds involved, maybe not your conventional kind, but uh, David can take us on a list apocalyptic uh, story um, role playing game with uh, mu is it? I always get this wrong. Is it just called Mutant or is it called Mutant Year Zero? Oh, that depends on the edition. Like the first it, actual I give edition, up. <laughs> the first actual edition, uh, edition was actually released in 1984. But they all have together like this post-apocalyptic setting, which is a bit grubby and a bit like crazy, but with a lot of dark humor. Um, the newest edition, Mutant Year Zero, was released by Free Pu League Publishing in 2014. And I think the English version is mostly published by Modifius. Modifius, I hope I spelled that correctly. <laughs> and there have been a lot of different like expansions, like Mutant Gen like Alpha, Mutant Mechatron, and Mutant Elysium, they are all set in the same time and the same setting, like two, three decades after an uh, apocalyptic event. Uh, two, three decades after an uh, apocalyptic event. Um, like, it's not 100% clear what happened, but it doesn't really matter for the storytelling. It's like um, on the GM to like explain the situation, maybe give Heinz what happened. 
the GM to like explain the situation, maybe give Heinz what happened. Um, the artwork in general is rather gritty, but but I think I think I like it. It's cool, and some of the artwork is downright great. Like uh, GenLab Alpha has like these animal mutants, which look like and there are like a few differences. In Mutant Year Zero, you play the name giving mutants, which live in the zone. While in GenLab Alpha, you play mutated animals that are kept in some kind of zoo. In Mutant Mechatron, you play robots in a massive factory that's falling apart. And meanwhile, in Elysium, you play humans in the apocalypse. So, but in theory, you can play all books together and you can make up your own story by just taking all those books. Um, however, each core book comes with its own set of comp with its own campaign and issues that the players are going to face. What I've really they are like the base set of rules is always the same, but like every book has like their own uh, focus. Like let's say mutants is all about mutations, and GenLab Alpha is more about like the behavior of animals between each other. Um, just in 19 year zero, you have like um, four attributes, which are strength, agility, wits, and empathy. While in GenLab Alpha, you switch empathy with instinct. And in Mechatron, you switch all attributes, which have like the, the same base and the same idea behind them, but the, the name is different. Like you have server, stability, processor, network. And then each book gives like your players a special ability. Like in Mutant Year Zero, you get mutations, obviously. <laughs> And those mutations are limited by resource like mutant points and mutant year zero. And those give you like the chance to succeed automatically in tasks. Like if you have asset spin, those give you like the chance to succeed automatically in tasks. Like if you have asset spit, you don't need to roll if you like want to open a lock. You just spit on them and, and they just, yeah, you know, the lock doors just melts. And which is rather interesting because like it's not like one dimensional because and which is rather interesting because like it's not like one dimensional because those uh, actual mutations are like multi use which is really cool hmm. um that like reminds me of dread where um there's a like simple role playing game but characters are allowed to succeed at so that's that's a cool mechanic to not have to roll for everything just be like i can always do this and it, it always gives a little bit more characterization to the characters too which is uh, very fun yeah here here in mutant user it comes like uh, comes at a cost at like potentially but it's really like cool from a like aspect if you can just go some go with it you know you don't need to roll some die or something just you can't just uh, say i I do exactly what I want and just describe it that way. Which empowers the players, which is always a good thing, I, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, but like in general, like all those books have like some special ability for the players. And in general, like the rule system is simple, but it's, uh, but it's good. It's well, for well thought. Like uh, let's say that there are in each book there are classes like in Ford, like uh, let's say that there are in each book there are classes like in in Mutant Year Zero you have like zone classes called like the Stalker or Gearhead, while in GenLab Alpha you have the Scavenger Warrior, and in Mechatron you have the clean cleaning robot, <laughs> <laughs> which has like a really powerful ability. The cleaning cleaning robot. <laughs> <laughs> which has like a really powerful ability which is such i'll come back later and in like uh, in elysium you have like the scholars which are like the the uh, knowledge keepers of the human and but basically it always works like your attribute pool plus skill pool plus your gear every six is a success and um yeah they can depending on what you use they, those uh, yeah the ones and six can have like special um effects that can trigger however if you roll like two successes like two sixes and you don't it doesn't work you roll one you can push your dice your your, your throw that means you re-roll everything except for the six and ones but on the second roll the ones can have like some negative effect like if you have gear 
a few d6 to your pool and you roll one on those d6 that means the gear can break because you overused it you used it the wrong way you, like you used the hammer and you slapped something so hard it broke the hammer but you fulfilled the task that's the important thing different mutations that you don't have the control over <laughs> like um I'm just taking Mutant Year Zero as an example because like that's the main book. And those um those mutation cause you lets you do some like crazy things. But if you use, but for each mutation point you will roll a die a D6. If it comes up with a one, it can can have some side effect. Like it can either like on the six it could supercharge your mutation, which means like you can use it again for free in the same second. Or like a one, which means you mutate even further. So you can have like at the same time, which will reduce the attributes, but give you another powerful like special ability. Um, in general, like combat is pretty deadly, but simple with a critical injury table. It's like more like storytelling, I feel like. And like a mutant user, you over you also have those settlement simulations. Have their own settlement and their stuff will happen there so that, me that means like you will have like random events every session that could be like uh, a group from outsiders like came to the settlement and they told you about some riches or like resources like clean water or food. or it could mean like some internal conflict like you have like some gang and those some gangs and those gangs fought each other and uh destroyed part of the settlement and similar things i was wondering if the game used the, the modifius system the one with 2d20 yeah, it's their the own their own engine pretty much um like the settlement you can develop it like you can find certain things in the zone you can like find a book and then you can decide if you want to keep your the book or the players can decide if they want to keep their book for their own to use it like as a guide in the zone or they can, uh, or they can uh, give it to the settlement to help develop some kind of society. You know, it's a fun little like resource management thingy, but I think it's like cool to make the like the players can have their own impact and make their own settlement. Um, yeah, then you have also a big like, their own settlement. Um, yeah, then you have also a big exploration. Um, aspect where you have like this zone that's like a huge map and you have like hex fields everywhere that you can go and discover like certain hex fields will be filled up by the uh, game master but otherwise they are pretty much hex fields will be filled up by the uh, game master but otherwise they are pretty much filled randomly which makes it pretty easy to uh, game masters to to fill up the map but at the same time um, yeah it gives the players a lot of like um, new things to explore and then you can find stuff in the in, in the find special um, artifacts and those artifacts could be something like a he-man figure like an action figure <laughs> um. if i if i remember correctly this game got um a little bit more publicity uh two years of it it was um uh, very inspired by XCOM and used the Mutant Year Zero's uh, combat system and um, general law to 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 exist. I think it was called Road to Eden or something like that. Uh, apparently, it was pretty good. Um, that, uh, yeah, yeah, that it still gets attention on top. That, uh, yeah, yeah, that it still gets attention on top the game. And I think that they ran a successful Kickstarter last year uh, on the the riding that uh, that popularity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's st it still gets good reviews on Steam. It's uh, yeah. it's a good game. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and maybe we'll we'll see more of that game. But and uh, yeah, and maybe we'll we'll see more of that game. That's pretty pretty cool. Yeah, there are like some. I'm just finishing up like my my small part, like this exp exp exploration thing, like this exploration part, which uh, that you can like encounter things like rot. Which is like some like encounters things like rot, which is like something yeah negative effect, which is like in the water in the air, which can have like a negative impact on your players. Um, but like things like the cleaning robots, they actually can clean that up for you. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> that's why they are a good ability. Yeah, pretty much playing Wally at that point. <laughs> um, yeah, altogether, it's it's an amazing system. It's like the rules are pretty simple, but like good, like complex enough, and like the artwork and like the ideas how to manage the game, it's like rather progressive and well thought. I think. So um, I can Wonderful. highly recommend the game. It's been on my my list of games to try for a while, and I'm I'm glad that you're you're talking about it because uh yeah it does seem like a very fun game to to play with. Yeah, the um, not exactly the same, but the video game has been like. Yeah, the um, not exactly the same, but the video game has been like on my list of uh, things I've been waiting for it to drop on sale for for quite a while. That's probably the leverage that get me uh, to look at it more. Uh, although I must say, like the fact that you can play as animals, um, it is it play as animals. Um, it is it, it, you know is quite sort of enticing. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, the thing, um, what's really interesting personally for me, it's like it gives the GM a lot of freedoms while empowering the players at the same time. Like that's my favorite thing about the general. And I can see why they are using this system for other games like Tales from the Loop. Yeah. Uh, also uh, published by Mafidius. Yeah, it's also by Free League Publishing or Modifius. It's like I think they're the uh, Free League publishing of the English market. I think. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, they both do really good uh, physical editions of the, the book that they publish. Uh, every single one that I've had was uh, felt really, really great and competent. Yep. I'm like, I own pretty much all of the Meat Eaters Die. Meat Eaters Die. It's about like. Uh, set in the GenLab Alpha version of Mutant Year Zero. It's about like militaristic rabbits <laughs> that have, <laughs> that they, they, yeah, they dislike everybody that uh, eats meat <laughs> and it's hard to get, but uh, I will, I think everybody that uh, eats meat <laughs> and it's hard to get, but uh, I will, I think I will get it one day. <laughs> oh, so they're stereotypical vegans. Yeah, a bit. <laughs> So now we have another topic. I think unless you want to have another topic. I think unless you wanted to tell us about uh, something about the mind. <laughs> about about uh, ever having a dream that felt like a story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk to you about uh, which is uh, the the actually the, the psychic espionage game um, i in truth i could do an entire episode of this game of this game uh, alone because there's a lot to uncover but i'll try to keep it short so uh, i have notes i hope to cover everything it's a 2015 comic by matt kint it's uh, well it's a story about uh, us government uh, having had in the past uh, uh, a, a, a secret division of uh, psychic operators who, who made countries, uh, they administered uh, uh, black ops, uh, grey ops uh, uh, everywhere and they were a branch of the government. During the uh, a kind of cold war, the, the, the Russians had uh, similar power then uh, and they were uh, basically having a cold war. Sometime uh, uh, one of these agents uh, went uh, at a breakdown, uh, it happened at a disaster in Zanzibar, and uh, after then the, the mind management was disbanded and uh, every agent uh, was uh, basically laid off. Hook uh, takes over a bit uh, later from here, so uh, actually uh, th there's uh, I, I didn't say names because otherwise this would be a big spoiler. So um, uh, the comic is a great comic, which has uh, the comic is a great comic, which has a lot of layers to uh, to read because it's uh, a story. It's it has a story behind the story uh, with. Uh, 
uh, small visual cues uh, and uh, kind of uh, small visual cues uh, and uh, kind of riddle scenes uh, and something like that and uh, it also has the uh, a little of uh, uh, side uh, si side uh, text which can be read and uh, it's actually related to what happens uh, in uh, in the panels you are reading it at the moment but uh, but uh, actually it uh, will turn out to be more by the end of the by by, by the end of reading the comics and uh, well if you are american you can uh, see you can uh, collect it uh, right now in uh, very very uh, easy to read uh, collections and they are available online and it's a recommended read but the game is a kind of a th and uh, uh, actually gaming masterpiece uh, now <laughs> not to get ahead of myself uh, mind management as a game is uh, uh, basically a hidden movement game it's played uh, you have on one side a recruiter from mind management uh, you have on one side a recruiter from mind management which uh, who has the the objective of recruiting uh, nine or 12 people in the city of zanzibar before 2 p.m in a day on the other zanzibar before 2 p.m in a day on the other side you have rogue agents of me of mind management uh, so people who break free of the organization who are uh, bent on uh, destroying it and uh, recruiter. Uh, their objective is to actually uh, find the recruiter and capture him or her so uh, the game plays like a hidden movement game you have a recruiter uh, turn then you have a rogue agent turn uh, you move on uh, a grid and uh, basically you can move only orthogonally and the recruiter has to move one step at a time on this uh, board only orthogonally and record uh, his movement during the same location so he has to move uh, like a traveling salesman problem he has to move uh, without entering two times the same square and uh, and uh, each of these uh, of these squares has two features out of a set recruiter knows in advance three features for example, there's a billboard, there's a newspaper, there are dogs, there is stuff which is uh, present in the comics, but you uh, will see it in the board. And uh, if you enter a square with a feature, that feature is hidden to players, the recruiter uh, can uh, recruit one people, uh, one person, so uh, one agent, and when they recruited uh, the total pool of agents available which is nine in a learning game and 12 agents available which is nine in a learning game and 12 in a full game the recruiter has one if the agent in turn can find the recruiter uh, before uh, the recruiter recruits all uh, the possible agents uh, then the uh, possible agents uh, then the rogue agent win now uh, basically this game is letter from Whitechapel simplified you don't uh, have uh, all the possible location from letter from Whitechapel you have kind of the same movement and basically what happens is that the recruiter moves and uh, the rogue agents uh, we who can perform uh, a movement of just two squares uh, compared to four squares for the recruiter and uh, they can perform one of the following action which is ask they can ask the recruiter if the recruiter has ever been in the course of the game on uh, one square with a feature they are in uh, the recruiter if uh, 
has been there uh, should uh, just place a step token, which is a small footprint, that uh, the recruiter has passed there at some point. Uh, the other action is reveal. Uh, they can ask if uh, the, the recruiter has, uh, uh, at which time the recruiter has passed at uh, a location. The time indicates the recruiter has passed at uh, a location. The time indicates the turn in which the recruiter has passed so that you have complete information about uh, the square and when the, the recruiter passed through it. And the last action possible is capture passed through it. And the last action possible is capture. If, they, if the agents believe that uh, they are in a square with the recruiter, they can try to capture it, uh, capture him. So uh, the problem is that, of course, uh, they you have one action per agent, and so uh, you have an action economy pretty tight, and uh, you, of course, cannot waste a capture that way because there's a lot to do and a lot to learn. Uh, to further complicate things, there are things like. Uh, which are agents controlled by the recruiter. The, you have two immortals which uh, basically uh, can be moved like uh, pawns on the map and when they are on the map an agent cannot try uh, uh, a capture there. Also if the immortals are in, uh, uh, in a square where both uh, uh, where they both share uh, a feature, a terrain feature they need to use to recruit, they can recruit like uh, as if they were the to use to recruit, they can recruit like uh, as if they were the recruiter. So it's basically an added power for the recruiter. Uh, they are also a liability because when agents uh, get in the same square as uh, Agents uh, get in the same square as uh, an immortal, they can perform a shakedown action, which is basically interrogate the immortal about a feature. If they guess correctly the feature they are asking the immortal, the recruiter cannot use that feature again in the game. So that's basically a double edged sword. Of course, the recruiter can use immortals to lure uh, the players, uh, can use immortals to uh, move away the players, or to just protect uh, himself. Uh, in addition to that, there is one last move available to the recruiter, which is the mind slip, which is basically a special movement, uh, which is a limited power the recruiter can use. Uh, Initially, the recruiter has one mind slip token. They can, is depending on the recruiter. For example, uh, you have uh, two possible recruiters, which are uh, the admin, who can perform a mind slip three squares in an orthogonal line, and you have the pipe girl, who, uh, who can perform the same mind slip three line. Uh, everything of this combined is uh, basically what uh, mind management is about, but what it is basically, it is a perfect two to four player uh, in the movement game, which plays in less than an hour and it <laughs> Of course, <laughs> if there are no questions. <laughs> uh, well, my only question is going to be, uh, this seems to be a very complex game, but a very interesting one. I always like uh, hidden, movement games um how... in truth is re is really simple mm -hmm. because where everyone moves into and uh, a small board when you record movement when the recruiter record movement and that is hidden and it's tracked with the dry erase marker uh, you just take turns it's very very fast okay i was uh, the question was more um how long does it take to to like introduce the game and get someone to be properly uh, able to play to play it? Like, who, would you say that it takes one two game? 
uh, yeah, I, I think uh, there is a simplified version of the game, which is the learning game, which is basically and uh, rogue agents uh, who try to capture the recruiter oh, right. without the mortals. And that is quite fast. I think that you can get the grasp of the game in exactly the, the, the learning game. But uh, uh, in truth, uh, it is not like it's difficult. Is that uh, I enjoy this game so much that I'm trying to to get ahead of, my, of myself and try to explain more than what is required. Because basically, really, it's uh, the recruiter moves for squares and recruits everyone who can who can be recruited in those who can be recruited in those four squares. It ends up in a hidden square. The agents uh, during their turn are uh, just trying to guess where the recruiter is, and if they cannot do that, they just move and ask where. Uh, the, and if they cannot do that, they just move and ask where uh, the recruiter has been. Uh, at the beginning of the game, you can be pretty sure that the recruiter moved there. But uh, at some point during the game, you will lose track of everything. Uh, at some point during the game, you will lose track of everything. Uh, to complicate this, or to make this more interesting, every odd turn, you have to say, uh, as the recruiter, you have to say how many people you have recruited so far, so that you can if it happened in one of the last two turns, but you can ensure that uh, a recruiting has happened, so you can have a vague track of how the recruiter moved. All right, I see. <laughs> it's good that they have a specific learning game version of people introduced into, game, into the game. Yeah, uh, th there are uh, a couple other simplifications, because there is an app which uh, has currently been developed just for iPhone. It has actually been developed for both iPhone, but at the moment of recording, it's only available on iPhone, which uh, gives solo and co-op mod, so without, with a bot recruiter, uh, for the game, for actually, currently just for the learning game but our plans to update uh, to have the full uh, the full game spectrum and uh, more than that there is uh, like the game has like 10 modules which are 10 mini expansions which can be added and uh, basically whenever the game ends you uh, have the option of opening, the, the losing side can open a shift package. A shift package is just a small comic book uh, written by Matt Kint uh, and uh, usually except of the, of the actual uh, management comic book. And uh, a special power to give an advantage to the previous losing side so that, uh, for example, you can gain new powers for rogue agents, new powers from the recruiter, you can get new rogue agents, new modifiers for the more, so on. And uh, these are uh, 10 packages which can be uh, opened uh, one after the other, and there are rules to integrate them permanently. Uh, for instance, uh, when you have uh, a selection of sheet packages, you can always decide to incorporate some. Uh, depending on the number, the, or the number of sheet packages that uh, uh, rogue agents want to employ, the recruiter can choose uh, the same number, minus one, of sheet packages for him. So that you can have, for example, three packages, two packages for the recruiter, and have a different game every time. Finally, because uh, this, uh, this is only half what this game is. There's, uh, this game is playing mind tricks on you all the time. Uh, I would uh, really encourage everyone to have a good hard look at the game and the game pictures on Board Game Geek, on the Kickstarter page, everywhere, because the game 
has a lot of subtle uh, mind tricks uh, with, which will make you put everything. Uh, for instance, the box is full of uh, two colors, red and blue messages, which say one thing in red and the contrary in blue. And depending on if you are uh, uh, looking with your uh, plain sight or with a red filter, you will get the the manual is full of this stuff and uh, also there are sometimes typos which are actually intended to convey a different message also uh, in in all game components including manual including uh, the inserts and stuff like that there are secret keywords you can enter at a website to unlock new content which is print and play or new rules for the game. Yeah, it's incredibly cool. I, I, I found nine of those so far, which uh, I, uh, this game is perfect. It, it makes you paranoid. Uh, for instance, in the punch board of the cardboard tokens, there is a message. Uh, I'll try to decipher it uh, without uh, the red filter. It says in red, all, ide all ideas are it says in red all, ide all ideas are recycled uh, do the right thing in, in meaning that i should throw this uh, cardboard out in the in blue it says do not throw this away use this to unlock a code on do not throw this away use this to unlock a code on the website so <laughs> i i, I I have not found a way to employ this, but I'm keeping this because <laughs> I'm told to throw it away. So it's it's perfect. So it's it's perfect. It's really the perfect theming. It makes you completely paranoid about everything. You don't want to try to, to throw anything away. You you are keeping everything, and you are reading the comics, and you are finding stuff everywhere. It's uh, really, really a nice theme. I think I uh, enjoy it. was to be just uh, a seven. Like, uh, I mean, uh, okay, if I'm in the mood, I will play this game. Uh, the theme has made it an eight because uh, uh, I I'll, I'll, do a comp I'll pay a compliment to this game. I'm playing a lot of The Sense of the Dark these days. A friend of mine uh, showed up while I was playing the scent, instead of adding my friend to a scent game, which could be done because it's an easy game to enter, I I suggested to play mind management. So I um, I understood then that I really like this game. This is a very good game by itself. It's fun. Wonderful. That does look <laughs> like a really fun game. <laughs> Yeah, so th this was basically a wall of words to say uh, in the movement is general to enter because the games you have, except Scotland Yard, which is uh, probably still the king, which is a very simple game. It's, it plays faster than this one and it's simple to play. You have letters from Whitechapel, which is basically the best game for multiple players there is. And Dracula, which is an old classic. I am personally a bit bored by F Fear of Dracula, especially because it drags in the end, but uh, it's uh, perfectly understandable. Uh, this is a difficult genre. I have to say, if you have two players and want to play a quick game without uh, uh, too many problems, but, but which feels satisfactory and deep, mind management is absolutely a great game to play well i'll be sure to have a look at it because it looks great um and with that final coded message uh it's all that we have time for this ending to the last nd you can catch us over at uh patreon.com slash the last nd with two e or follow us at the last nd in tw on twitter or subscribe to your preferred uh, podcast app so it's a goodbye from me and from alessio bye from Kara and from Sam. Uh, goodbye for myself. And remember that the second E in Stan D is for egg. Expionage. <laughs> Great! <laughs>